Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. My name is Andy Johnson. I'm the superintendent here in San Marcos Unified, and we are very excited to be able to share some information with you this evening about a potential bond measure that our board of trustees is considering for the November ballot. Before I jump into a couple of housekeeping items, I'd like to invite uh, Oliver Sufi, who is our district translator, uh, to address. We have, I understand, some Spanish speakers on the call, some participants here. Um, so Oliver's got some logistics for them on um, things they need to do to click in and get their translation. So Oliver. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Buenas señoras y señores. Soy el traductor del Distrito Escolar Unificado de San Marcos, Oliver Sufi. Si ustedes necesitan interpretación el día de hoy, lo que pueden hacer es de momento en la barra de abajo eh, verán lo que es una tableta que dice global o eh, interpretación. Van a escoger lo que es el idioma español primero y luego van a elegir eh, eh, mudar o eh, silenciar lo que es el eh, modo eh, auditivo de lo que es la, eh, eh, del idioma principal. Sería español primero y luego eh, silenciar eh, idioma principal. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, we are here to speak a little bit about a potential bond measure uh, for the school district. Uh, my slides tonight will take about 15 minutes, maybe 20 at the outside. So if you have questions as I'm going through the presentation, uh, if you just go ahead and drop them in the chat and uh, we'll be able, we'll be uh, sure to answer as many of those questions as we can this evening. If, we, any, if there's any question we can't get to or that requires a little more research, we will make sure that we get that onto our FAQ, our Frequently Asked Questions uh, sheet, which is on our website. So with that, let me go ahead and just double check and make sure Oliver, are we okay with Spanish and all of our translation before I get started? Uh, Dr. Johnson, I had a message here that says that Spanish is not working. So um, it's written in English. So I think that individual might be able to um, understand. However, I had to turn it on after Oliver explained everything. I couldn't turn it on or he would be out of the room. So if people could try again, it should be working now. And Jennifer, if you can say that in Spanish, if need to be, that would be great. Thank you. I believe Oliver is still on. I see, still see him here. Okay, let's just check. Oliver, are you still with us? He, he will show in the webinar as a panelist, okay, but he, can, he can't speak to us if he's doing the interpretation. I'm seeing messages now that it says, yes, it is working. Interpretation is working. So it looks like we're good. Okay, I am going to begin. Let me go back here and share my screen. And get us started. Okie doke. Make sure everybody can see. Are we good, Aaron? Can you see that? Slides? All right, great. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, as you know, San Marcos Unified is an amazing school district. We are award winning. I like to tell groups that there are 42 school districts in San Diego County, and San Marcos Unified is top five amongst those school districts. We are top five for a number of reasons, uh, mostly our student achievement, uh, the remarkable accomplishments that our students uh, uh, achieve here while they're with us and then beyond when they leave us. Um, we have a very innovative and collaborative uh, community. We have um, a lot of uh, really, I think, um, amazing programs for our students. You are aware that we are uh, heavily engaged in a strategic plan under the header of Future Ready, and we are very, very proud of the many, many programs that we give 
to our students that really do position them well for life after 12th grade. And we're very proud of that. I wanna take on just a moment and speak briefly about budgets uh, because if you are a member of the public or your staff member who isn't thinking about school district budgets all day, every day, like, like we do, like many of us do, uh, it can be very confusing. So I wanna just speak very briefly about kind of our district's general operating budget. If you're reading the newspapers, you're probably seeing right about now a lot of news coming out about uh, California and some of the strains that we that California is uh, experiencing and going to be experiencing in the next fiscal year. That most definitely will put a strain on school district budgets. We will not be excluded from that. Uh, we'll feel it as well. Um, but all of the most of the most of the money that San Marcos Unified uh, receives for our general operating comes from the state of California. And our general budget pays for our teachers, our support staff, our administrators, our school books, our supplies, our programs for our students. Um, one of the things that's really important to know is that California tends to be very volatile in terms of its, its funding. The reason for that is, I won't go into a ton of detail, but I will say that one of the reasons that is in California is because our tax structure is very heavily dependent on the top, they call the 1% wage earners. Uh, that tends to be Silicon Valley, other, other, um, other businesses and, and folks in that, that highest bracket. So when those people are having a great year and the stocks are up, California tends to be in a great financial uh, position. When there's a downturn that, and that top 1% doesn't have a great year, then the rest of the state has struggles. So where every state is gonna have fluctuations in their economy, that just happens. Uh, San, um, California tends to have kind of wild swings. I say all that to say that when, um, when, our, when our public and our community is, is getting information from us as a school district, and it seems like there are swings, it's not because the San Marcos Unified is not handling our money well. We are very, very good and very, very um, conscious about every dime we spend here. It's because the state fluctuates so much and we're kind of at the mercy of uh, how that goes. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and just say all of that that I just described in our general regular operating, bu uh, operating uh, budget sits over in kind of one bucket over here. I'll just kind of push, picture it over here. What we're gonna talk about tonight is a completely separate bucket and that's facilities funding. So we do have money in our general fund for uh, maintenance and operations where our, we have a crew that's out there and they're cutting grass and they're uh, you know, fixing leaky, leaky pipes and those kinds of things. But when it comes to major work that needs to be redone, uh, needs to be done, uh, like when a school is, is getting uh, very old or at the end of its lifespan, there is no dedicated state uh, funding to school districts for, that, for those facilities needs. The state doesn't, doesn't provide that. Um, that is why local school districts will will generally ask for support from their local communities in the form of a general obligation bond uh, to meet those needs. I will say that the state of California, you see the bottom the bottom bullet on this slide, the state of California does every so often pass a state bond. And what happens there is then there is facility money and it sits in a kind of a big pot up at the state. Um, and school districts can apply for matching funds if they have their own local approved, voter approved uh, general obligation bond funds. I say that, to, and I, I say that, and it's also very important to know that SMUSD, if we were to pass a local bond measure, would qualify for up to about $96 million in state matching funds. It's very important to know that there is not a box of money with $96 million with San Marcos Unified written on the top of that box waiting for us to come get it. This money is, as I said, all in a big pot. If we were able to pass a local bond here, we would have access to those funds. If we don't, those, those $96 million would go to some other school district anywhere in the state that did pass a local bond. So it's just really important to know. And I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. And I'm gonna to try to go slower for Oliver, our translator. He, he requested that I speak slowly this evening, which is always a little bit of a challenge for me. So. How do we, hold on for one second. 
how do we identify um how do we identify our facilities needs san marcos unified has a facilities master plan and we update that plan uh, frequently periodically the most recent update was done just this past november it was presented to our school board and adopted by our school board in november of 2023 and you can see that QR code there. If you want to scan that QR code, it will take you directly to our website. You also see on that bottom bullet there, the uh, web address where you can find our full facilities master plan. This is the entire plan, the whole thing, um, as it was adopted by our school board. This is the facilities plan that our facilities team works off of. And there are kind of two main sections to the plan. The first section is what we call educational specifications or ed specs. And that question is that that portion of the of the plan addresses this question, what is needed? What kind of a classroom space, what kind of facilities are needed for a safe and modern education in 2024? I would guess that most of us when we were in school went to pretty plain old classrooms where the seats were in a row and in rows and the teacher was up at the front at the chalkboard. That kind of a setup still has its place, I suppose. Uh, but in 2024, we want to know that our, our actual physical environment is supporting the kind of future ready learning that we are uh, providing for our students. So that's one part of this plan is the educational specifications. The other part of the plan addresses the actual uh, assessment of the facilities. So we have a, um, a full assessment has been done of all of our sites. In our district, we have 18 physical school sites, plus a district office, a maintenance yard, transportation yard, other buildings and facilities that we operate. And in our facilities master plan is a full assessment of each one of those um, facilities. <clears throat> and they are ranked in, need, in order of need. From our oldest and most neediest schools at the top, that would be Woodland Park all the way down to the least needy school, which would be Richland Elementary, which has just been fully rebuilt. So um, again, if you if you would like, you may go to that uh, website and see the full facilities master plan. That is the plan that prioritizes all of the facilities needs in our district. So I'd like to highlight a couple of things that are in that plan. Uh, First of all, the, the I, I always like to say that if you don't have students in our school or you're not engaging in our, in, uh, you're not uh, interacting in our school facilities on a day-to-day -day basis, you might drive up and down San Marcos Boulevard and see San Marcos High School, which is a gorgeous facility, and think school district is doing great. And that is most definitely the case on many of our facilities. But we do have older aging schools that really do have extensive uh, repair needs, even some, some infrastructure needs like Woodland Park, like Paloma, uh, like Knob Hill, Twin Oaks, and others. One of the things I want to highlight on this slide is that we have 146 deteriorating portable classrooms. Um, you may know them as trailers or portables. I like to share that in a previous district, uh, I, I started hearing people refer to EBs, and I wasn't sure what an EB was, and I had to ask, and they told me that an EB is an emergency building. That's how they referred to their portables, as emergency buildings. Point being, um, they were never designed to be permanent facilities. They were designed to be used in an emergency. You have um, an influx of students that came unexpectedly. You need a, a place to put them because the school year is starting you know, we put them in the in a portable or an emergency building while we figure out uh, a more permanent place for them. And is the, as is the case in many school districts, those portables have been on our campuses for 25, 30 years. They have leaks, they have some structural damage, um, and we want to make sure we're addressing that. Uh, we also have, um, you see the second bullet point there, I just mentioned structural damage, water leaks, uh, water brings mold, um, I want to say that our maintenance and operations crews are on top of those things as soon as they, they get a report of it. Um, they're very good at that. And we don't have very much mold in our in our school district, um, in our facilities, but we want to get all the way down to zero. Uh, to me, that's very, very important. We also have the need for labs, career technical and instructional technology needs, as I mentioned, 
um, and uh, safety and security improvements are needed at many of our school sites. So I hate to say that um, as a superintendent, I have to think about the, these kinds of things, but you read the headlines just like I do. And safety is more important now on our, on our school campuses than ever before. I do want the community to know that we have, we enjoy a very uh, close relationship, a very collaborative relationship with the sheriff. And two summers ago, they did a full safety assessment of all of our campuses and gave us a report um, of all the play, all the all of the, the the condition of our facilities in terms of safety. We have been working on making improvements there since we received that report. That is a report that, of course, we don't make public um, because we don't want the bad guys to know where the where the little gaps would be. But I want you to know that um, in terms of bringing our 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 schools to full 2024 as safe as they possibly can be, that's going to require some money. Uh, and that's why that would be included in a potential bond measure. I know I'm going too fast, Oliver. I'm trying to slow down. So the board is considering a November 2024 school bond election. It is estimated to bring into us about $324 million. It's very important to note that local bond money stays local. Uh, it is locally controlled. So if the, if the uh, San Marcos voters were to approve a general obligation bond, it would be all, all those dollars would be 100% for San Marcos schools. The state cannot take any of those funds from us. Uh, where the board will probably make a decision in June of this year, and uh, they they will um, decide at that point whether or not they are ready to uh, put this on the ballot. I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but I wanted to go through this again. Uh, these are some of the priority bond projects uh, in, that would be included: removing hazardous materials mold, asbestos, lead pipes, wherever they're found. Again, I want our, our, particularly I want our families to know that we do not have asbestos all over the place, um, but in some of our older facilities, we wanna make sure we get all the way down to zero. Uh, so that would be an important one. Repairing, replacing deteriorating roofs, plumbing, heating, ventilation, gas lines, sewer lines, the, the kinds of things that are in the walls and under the, under the floors that we don't normally see, uh, those, are, those are getting to the end of their lifespan as well. I also like at this point to um, just share a personal anecdote that I live here in North County. My home was built in 1989. And right about 2019, when we hit the 30 year mark, everything started and need, need to be replaced. We needed a new water heater. We needed a new air conditioner for the house. Um, when we had the air conditioner technician come to uh, repair our air conditioner, he asked me to come look at it with him. And he showed me all the places over the past 30 years it had been fixed and refixed and taped together and chewing gum and all those pieces. And he said, um, you know, I can continue. I can do one more little, you know, fix here, but you're going to need to replace uh, your air conditioner because they they have a lifespan and your, your, your unit here is at the end of its lifespan. School facilities are really no different. Um, you know, there are our facilities here in this district are built really, really well and very, very modern, and they do have a lifespan. So we're, uh, as I'm as I'm kind of going through this, um, many of our facilities are getting to the end of that lifespan. I mentioned also upgrading our older schools to current health and safety codes. And then on the right-hand side of the, of the slide here, upgrading our classrooms and labs for math, science, engineering. That's very, very important for our, our future-ready uh, instruction. Uh, career tech, classrooms and facilities, and then, as I mentioned, also student safety and school security. So the uh, rate at which the board is considering for this would be four cents per $100 in assessed property value. It's important to note that assessed valuation is different than market value. We all know that the market fluctuates and goes up and down. Um, and over time, if you bought your home 20 years ago, it most definitely could be sold now for more. That's the market value. But the assessed value is generally, it's, it's, the, it's the, uh, the value of your home, generally the last time it was assessed, which is generally the last time it was sold. So um, for a, I, I'm, I'm going to get my math wrong in here, and you can tell me if I'm doing this wrong. But for a $500,000 home, a, a home that was assessed at $500,000, 
four cents per $100 roughly, I think, translates to about $200 a year, I believe, for that homeowner. Is that about right? That's correct. Okay. Um, so that is the that is the rate the board is considering. As I mentioned earlier, we would qualify for state matching funds. So it's roughly for every uh, if the if this bond were to pass for every three dollars that our local community is uh, funding, the state would give a dollar as well. So that's that's nice. It's almost like someone used the the example this morning of it's kind of like a like when your employer matches contributions you're making to your 401k. Perhaps uh, that might be a, a parallel that would make sense to some. It's also very important to note that in law, school districts that have a bond program active must also have a citizens oversight committee. We have to have annual audits and very specific project lists. So the citizens oversight committee is members of the community. They are citizens, not staff. Uh, they do meet with staff, staff is there, but um, and those, those meetings run through the life of the bond. And that is designed so that the citizens can make sure that the school district is uh, uh, building the facilities that, that they said they were, that they're making the improvements that were outlined in the original bond measure, uh, and that they're following the law and those kinds of things. So uh, we had a citizens oversight committee running all the way through the Prop K uh, projects, and they were very complimentary of the work that the district did during the Prop K um, uh, building projects. That is now all completed, and that would happen again if another bond were to pass. And that bottom bullet point there uh, in law, in California, 55% of the voters would need to approve the bond for it to pass. That is most of what I wanted to share. So we will open it up and see if there were any questions in the chat. I also want to say that for anybody who's on the call, if you have any questions or after tonight you think of something else while you're uh, driving home or you're doing whatever, um, please do uh, email the communications at smusd.org. We monitor that every single day. Uh, all of the uh, information I just shared is also on our website. So we do want to hear from you and we want to know what questions you have. Um, and uh, we'll make sure to answer those. And, and some of the questions that have been coming up recently have been very good ones. And we're going to continue to uh, update our FAQ to make sure that all those questions are asked and answered. So with that, I will ask Amy if there are any questions that have been uh, put in the chat that we might address. Hi, Dr. Johnson. Yes, we do have some questions that have come in. So the first question is, will the four cents per $100 go down over time on our property taxes? Okay, I can answer that one. Um, so what the four cents is, is it's, it's an estimate calculated um, as based on what our total assessed value of all properties in San Marcos are currently. So if assessed values were to go up over time, then it's possible that that four cents would drop and be less. Um, if, if assessed values um, dropped for some reason, it is also possible um, that that four cents could tick up um, slightly. I can tell you um, historically, our assessed values have grown substantially over time. Um, and so if that were to continue, then yes, it's possible that four cents would drop um, over the years that we're, the bond is paying out. Great, we have another question. And that question is regarding Prop K. And it is, what are taxpayers currently paying right now for Prop K per $100 assessed? So currently right now, um, taxpayers are paying 5.9 um, um, cents in for Prop K. Um, so, um, it, and, and Prop K um, could potentially go up to, to, six, to six cents. Um, so with Prop K plus the potential new bond, um, it would go up potentially to approximately 10 cents per hundred dollars of assessed valuation. Okay, we have another question. This is regarding terms of the proposed bond. So the term um, of the proposed bond is appro approximately 30 years. So we would 
um, began paying um, on the bond in um, 2025. And the final um, payoff in it would be in um, 2054. Okay, we have another question. Um, is Next question is, um, who pays for the general obligation bond? Is this only for property owners? Yes, that is correct. Um, so all that four cents per hundred dollars assessed value would be assessed on all um, properties located within the school district boundaries. Um, another question, um, if we know what is the average assessed value of a home within our district? So I don't know the average, but I can tell you the median. That's kind of what we use when we look at general obligation bonds. So the median assessed value of homes in San Marcos is 522,989. So if you um, calculate that out, what that means is essentially um, the median property owner would be paying $209 per year on this. So half the half of the property owners would pay more than 209 and half um, would pay less than 209. But 209 is that um, would be that median rate based on that $522,000 median assessed value. Great. We have another question, and this is regarding the state matching funds. Um, and that is um, with other districts potentially passing um, general obligation bonds, um, is there a priority that would go to unified school districts like San Marcos? Um, the, the state matching funds don't um, work, aren't prioritized based on the type of school district you are. They're based on um, the age of your particular school. So um, Dr. Johnson had mentioned that Woodland Park is at the top of our list. And one of the reasons it is on the top of our list is because it qualifies for the most matching funds from the state um, because it is one of our oldest schools. So, and it hasn't had been modernized or upgraded um, in, in a long time. Um, so that is how we will prioritize the projects based on the, because we wanna maximize both our local funds and we wanna capture as much of those state funds as we, as we can. Um, so that's how we can prioritize. We want to get projects in place for those schools that qualify, and then we can immediately send an application to the state so we can get that um, matching funds as quick as possible. Our next question, does declining enrollment affect any of our facilities needs? Um, let's see, that is a great question. Um, I would say, you know, may, maybe, maybe not, definitely still the case that um, we have declined in enrollment, but we certainly have not declined to the level of maybe some of our neighboring districts. Um, we still need every single one of our schools at this point. There's there's no chance we're going to close any of our schools, and we would still have those needs at some of our older schools. We still absolutely can easily spend every dollar that comes from this bond. Um, just upgrading and modernizing those schools that are that are older. Great. Our next question is, um, can we address the Melrose taxes in our district? Um, okay, so not not sure exactly um, what that question is getting at, but um, we do have Melrose. We call them our, our a community facility districts, and so that is a totally separate tax. Um, just based on individual developments throughout our district. And um, we do have, so those particular homeowners that bought or have homes in those particular developments um, are being um, assessed at that additional Melrose tax. taxes. So this general obligation bond would be, you know, above and beyond for all property owners. Great. And our next question, um, over how many years will the bond mature? So the what we intend at this point in time is that this will be a 30 year bond that will be paid off over 30 years. A question about the community. Um, somebody heard that Palomar College could potentially be exploring a bond measure. Um, do we know if that's moving forward? Yeah, that I can speak to that. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's that would be a question for their school board. Uh, their gov their governing board as well. They'd be in the same kind of uh, process that we would be in. So um, I can't really speak to Palomar. 
what are any other funding sources that have potentially been considered for school rehab of our facilities? Good question. Okay, so I think as Dr. mentioned, Dr. Johnson mentioned in his one of his talking points, um, we have really our, our general um, fund, our, upper, our general um, operating fund is really to pay salaries for our staff. That's that is not meant to do these big upgrades. And unfortunately, the state just doesn't provide that kind of funding. Um, we need all of our general fund um, um, money to pay for just our regular things like supplies, our utility bills, um, and then certainly um, uh, salaries for all of our staff. Um, so really, um, this is the only way school districts can get large um, sums of money to do these construction projects. Um, however, we do do a great job here in San Marcos because we do um, have that a pretty robust community facility district program. Um, so, but remember when that when I mentioned before the, uh, when the, with the question about the Melrose taxes, um, we are able to generate some funds for that, but those funds must be spent only in the schools um, that are paying that particular um, Melrose tax. And and the dollars that they generate are just are not large enough. Like we maybe can get two million dollars from uh, one Melarus. You cannot um, upgrade an entire school for two million dollars. We can do very smaller projects with those kinds of money, and we do leverage all of those different funding sources that we have. But the kind of upgrades and stuff that we really need that we're talking about, the only way to get it is through a general obligation fund. We have another question regarding cost. What is the cost to SMUSD to do this bond? Um, so um, we we will have to pay for to put the um, ballot language um, on 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 the November election, but that's that's really the only cost um, that to the district. Um, so this is. Um, that we're not, you know, we're not allowed to put any of our general operating money um, to pay for, you know, the campaign or anything like that related related to the bots. So very, very limited funding that we will be able to put, you know, towards this. Great. And then we have another question. What are the next steps in this process? Do you want to next, address that, Dr. Yeah, next steps, um, the board would take action. Uh, well, if the, the board will consider this in June, uh, whether or not to put the um, ballot on, uh, sorry, the measure on the ballot. And if they decide to do that, then you would see it on the November uh, presidential, it's the, the, the presidential election in, uh, in November of 2024. Great. Um, so we have a question regarding what you just mentioned, Aaron, regarding a campaign. Who will run the campaign and pay for the campaign? So, so today, I don't think it's uh, appropriate for us to be talk talking about the campaign quite yet. Again, our governing board will need to make a decision first to actually place this on the ballot. Um, and, you know, our purpose is just to share information um, about the needs um, that we have in our in our district. We can't actually not allowed to discuss um, campaigns. Um, another question, what percentage did Prop K pass last time? Um, so Prop K passed by a percentage of 63.4% back in 2010. And then looks like we have a final question. Will a recording of this meeting be made available? Uh, yes. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I think we did for the last one as well for staff. Uh, so yes, we, we can definitely do that. And when we have the recording finalized, you can find it on our website on the homepage, smusd.org. There is a link. It says Bond 2024. You can go there, and that's where we will host a recording of the meeting. Okay. So with that, thank you, everybody. I really want to appreciate, I want to thank, and I do appreciate everybody for signing on today. Uh, and, and again, if you have questions, you have that email there. Uh, communications at smusd.org is monitored daily. 
any other questions you have, any other thoughts, we definitely want to hear from you. So uh, thank you so much for logging on and have a great evening.